Dr. Nishim Kanika done his um, MSc uh, and BSc in physics from University of Bombay. Then he did his PhD in um, NCRA TFR, National Center for Radio Astrophysics TFR in Pune under University of course, back then. Then he held two postdoctoral, named postdoctoral fellowships. One was Nova Fellowship at Captain Institute in Groningen from 2002 to 2004, and then the fellowship from 2004 to 2008 at uh, NRAO in the USA, National Radio Astronomical Observatory, USA. He has also received uh, Sarno Jayanti Award, uh, Sarno Jayanti 2015, and Shanti Sharup Bhatnagar Award 2017. His main research interest uh, lies in the in interstellar medium, and he is particularly fanatic about fundamental constant and how fundamental constants evolve with redshifts. So, Nishi, uh, up to you. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Shuman. And uh, so let me start by saying I'm really sorry for all the mess that happened last week. And uh, many apologies indeed. And I'd like to, to thank Abhirup, uh, especially, you know, who spent a lot of time last night and then a couple of nights ago trying to fix this problem. So without, without whom I probably would still have my old laptop uh, working terribly. Okay, so I'm going to be talking to you about uh, astronomical spectroscopy. And I should say at the start also that I tend to speak really fast. Some of you may have already noticed this. Uh, and uh, I always tell myself at the start of a talk that I should speak slowly, and I usually remember for about two minutes or so. And then I start speaking fast again. So I will rely upon you to kind of, you know, uh, do something. Normally when I'm in a, in, a, in, a, in a lecture, in a normal lecture with people around, I tell people to throw chalks at me. This unfortunately cannot be done here, but, uh, you know, just, just do something. I mean, uh, 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 put something into a chat box. And, yeah, or they can out. raise their hand. That will sound a ping. Ah, good, excellent. Yeah, that, 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 that'll fix it and without the problem of chocks. So I was told to, I was asked to talk about uh, radio spectroscopy, but uh, I, I didn't realize, we realized that, that, that there was no lecture on general astronomical spectroscopy. So I decided to give a brief introduction to astronomical spectroscopy before uh, telling you why you should love uh, radio spectroscopy more than all the other forms of spectroscopy. And uh, sadly, uh, one of the masters of radio spectroscopy uh, Govind Swaru passed away a few months ago, and uh, and he was of course the person uh, who, behind uh, who who designed and uh, led the construction of the GMRT, the telescope that you see in the background of this slide, and which has been used to do some wonderful radio spectroscopy over the last twenty years or so. So it's sad that we don't have Govind around, but we have his work. Oh. So this is the broad outline of the talk. I'll tell you a little bit about what are spectral lines and why they are interesting from the point of view of astronomy. I'll then take you through a rapid tour of the of astronomical spectral lines, starting from the ultraviolet and going all the way through the radio. I'll tell you uh, a little bit about why you should love radio spectroscopy more than any other branch of spectroscopy, and not necessarily radio astronomers, but radio spectroscopy. And then I'll kind of list a few you know fun lines with, with, with which you can do things. And this is the problem of a one-hour talk; it's hard to do anything in detail. But I thought I should spend a couple of slides telling you about cute stuff that you can do with a 21 centimeter line, which is really, you know, a wonderful line, perhaps the most important line in astronomy or so I would think. So that's a broad outline of the talk. And I should, you know, I've given you a caveat over there that there will be a strong cosmological or large scale structure bias coming from my background and my affections. So what are spectral lines? So spectral lines are basically quantum mechanical transitions in atoms or molecules at some specific frequency. And they arise because the atom or molecule in question makes a, a jump, a quantum jump, from one energy state to another energy state. And so these are intrinsically narrowband phenomena. You, uh, you see them only at the frequency uh, with separate, uh, corresponding to the energy separation between the two energy levels. And you see a small pulse of energy at, at that uh, uh, specific frequency with some small width associated with the spectral line. And the lines could be either in emission, for example, if you have a transition happening from an upper energy level to a lower energy level, and that would come because, for example, the gas is heated or, uh, or there's some background radiation that causes the, that causes the excitation of the, of the energy levels. Or it could happen if the gas is lying towards a background star or a quasar, some source, some torch, where you, you could actually have absorption of the light passing through the gas and which causes a uh, uh, removal of a photon or photons of that energy. 
And in that case, the lines are in absorption. And so an example of absorption is shown uh, up here at the right, in the top right uh, 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 figure, where you see a star. And you see these, so this is the observed band going from blue up to red, the observed visual band. And you see a bunch of these black uh, narrow lines over here. And these lines are at, are, are arise because of absorption in the, in, the, in the stellar atmosphere of photons coming in from the center of the star. And these were, were, were discovered in the 19th century and uh, gave us lots of information about the sun uh, uh, right at the beginning. I'll give you a little bit more about that in a second. Now, the physics of quantum mechanical transitions of, of spectral lines is, yeah, I mean, covers a whole gamut of physics. It includes electronic transitions, you know, the classic, the transitions from principal quantum number states in the Bohr atom, fine structure transitions, hyperfine structure, molecular rotation, inversion, and when you go to more and more complicated molecules, you get more and more complex mixtures of these transitions. For example, in a very simple molecule, OH, you have lambda doubling, which is an, uh, essentially any, any effect that causes splitting of energy states can give rise to a quantum mechanical transition. Some of them are forbidden, some of them are highly forbidden and so on, but you can in principle have a quantum mechanical transition. And you'll see in a second, even forbidden lines are extremely important in astronomy. The important take home though is that the line frequency identifies the line. And this st statement is, a, is often made. It should be made with a slight caveat. So I'll come to the caveat in a second. But in, for example, the ultraviolet or in the low frequency radio, the line frequency definitively identifies the line. And so if you observe a, a difference in the measured frequency from the lab frequency, then this must arise due to motions. So if the source of the line is moving towards you, then the line will be blue shifted. It will be shifted towards a shorter wavelengths. On the other hand, if the source is moving away from you, the line will be shifted to longer wavelengths towards the red. And this is basically just a Doppler effect that we are familiar with. And an example of the Doppler effect is shown for this uh, star, which is moving in the binary kind of an orbit. And you can see that as the star moves away from us, or now it's moving towards us, the lines move towards the blue. And now it's moving away, the move, they move towards the red. And again, it turns around. And so you can infer uh, in, or get information about an object's kinematics from the red shifts or blue shifts of its lines. And this is really important in astronomy because in astronomy we can't go out and you know, physically measure the velocity by you know, taking a speed gun or something. This is essentially a speed gun uh, for astronomy. So you can work out the kinematics of an object from the red shifts or blue shifts of its lines. And the beauty of this is shown in the lower right figure where uh, what you see is a velocity field of the galaxy M33 in the 21 centimeter line. And this image is basically an image of the 21 centimeter line uh, that I mentioned earlier, which I'll talk about in some detail. Don't worry about what the line is for now. It's just some line which is tracing the gas in the galaxy. And what's happening is that the gas on the, on the lower left side of the galaxy is moving away from us. The gas on the upper right side of the galaxy is moving towards us. Basically the whole galaxy is rotating. Uh, in the direction uh, with lower going away and upper coming towards us. And as a result, you see this very beautiful velocity field where all the gas on the left side is moving, uh, is red shifted. All the gas on the blue side is blue shifted. On the, on the right side is blue shifted. And so you can actually determine the rotation of the galaxy. And I will tell you the, uh, some, I mean, the implications of this are astonishing or, or, or can be astonishing. And I will focus on this particular thing right at the end of the talk to tell you about stuff that you can do with something which is apparently so trivial. But I mentioned a little while ago that the line frequency identifies the lines. And I also mentioned that, you know, there are forbidden lines that, uh, that are present because you, you can have energy levels which any splitting in energy will allow you to have a line. And very often it's hard to detect these lines in the lab if they are forbidden. But it turns out that because the interstellar medium <clears throat> contains huge amounts of gas, extremely weak lines, unknown in the lab, can actually be detected from the interstellar medium. In fact, there was a survey done about 15 years ago of, the, of this very famous molecular cloud in the, in, towards the, the center of the Milky Way, called Sagittarius B2, and about 20% of the lines in that, in that cloud were actually not known in the lab. And this is quite astonishing. I mean, and these are just from complex molecules. There is a wide range of mixed energy levels which can produce these uh, interesting spectral lines. I should mention one more thing. I said the line frequency identifies the line. 
And that is true up to a point. It's true in the optical, for sure, the ultraviolet. It is actually not entirely true in the millimeter wave band. And that's again because the molecular frequencies, the molecular lines come in, the, in, in that wave band. And there have been many embarrassing cases. What can happen is that you can have uh, a transition in one molecule between two energy levels, giving you uh, a line at some, at some frequency, and then a different transition in a different molecule between two uh, different levels from different physics, giving rise to emission at the same frequency. If it, we nearly got burnt by this. We were searching for molecular oxygen with the very large array about 10 years ago. And we thought we had a spectacular detection of molecular oxygen. And then uh, Dave Meyer, a friend of mine, said, hang on a minute, could this be something else? And this was at about uh, uh, 50 gigahertz or so. And so we, were, we didn't think that it could be anything else. But then we decided to go and check. And so we did a test with uh, using the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, uh, this wonderful telescope in Chile. And we found that this line was actually not from molecular oxygen, but it was actually from acetaldehyde. And that's the problem, that you can have two completely different species giving you uh, spectral lines at the same frequency. And this especially happens at the millimeter wavelengths. And so one should be very careful before you claim the existence of a line from a single, uh, or, or the existence of a species from a single line. You should really use the, observe one line and then say, okay, if the line is so strong, then I should observe a second line at this frequency if it's from this species. And then go and search for the second line. And that will give you a safe... Uh, that will give you confidence that the line is indeed from that species. But this is the beauty of spectroscopy. You can get kinematics. You can identify uh, lines from the frequencies and species from the, from the lines. And you can probe a wide range of, of physics in absorption or in emission. So what are the kind of lines that you see? So let's start with the most abundant element in the universe, hydrogen. About 75% of the universe is hydrogen. And the bulk of it is in the atomic phase, what is called H1. H uh, Roman uh, one, and that's the most abundant ele element in the universe. So the the simplest lines in uh, atomic hydrogen are the Lyman series, the Balmer series, the Paschen series, which are basically transitions, electronic transitions from uh, from energy levels from two, three, four, etc. to n equal to one, three, four, five, etc. to n equal to two for the Balmer series, and so on. So essentially transitions between principal quantum number states. And Lyman alpha is uh, perhaps the, is, is the strongest of these lines by far. Most of the hydrogen in the universe is in the ground state. The, uh, the Einstein A coefficient for, 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 uh, for these lines, electronic lines, is extremely large <clears throat> of the order of 10 to the 8 per second. So you very rapidly, uh, even if you excite the hydrogen to a higher state, you very rapidly come down to the ground state. So Lyman alpha is very strong. And the Lyman alpha line is at 1215.71 angstroms. That's a powerful line. And you see that in emission from really high redshift galaxies, redshifts of 8, 9, 10. And uh, it's one of the main probes of the universe. Another important line is Balmer alpha or H alpha. Similarly, H beta, H gamma and so on. But H alpha is the strongest of these. And that's the line from quantum number 3 to quantum number 2. And the line is at about 6,563 angstroms in the optical. And so this was well known in the in the 19th century. It was found by, by, by Johannes Baumert. Then, so, so this is a set of lines which is shown in the bottom left figure over here. They transitions from principal quantum number energy levels. On the right side, you see a completely different line. And that's a line within the ground state of atomic hydrogen. And that happens because of the possibility of, of, of electronic and protonic spin. And so when you have the possibility of spin, so that's an entirely quantum mechanical effect. When you have the possibility of spin, the orientations of the spins of the proton electron can be parallel or anti-parallel. And that gives rise to two possible energy levels within the ground state of the of uh, hydrogen and, and, and within up, upper states as well. But essentially, the, the state of the parallel spin has a higher energy than the state with the anti-parallel spin. And so you can make a transition, a hyperfine transition, which goes from the state with the parallel spin to the state with the anti-parallel spin. And that line has a frequency of 1420.4 megahertz, which corresponds to a wavelength of 21.11 centimeters. And this has been immortalized as a 21 centimeter line. So it's one of our main lines in, uh, in uh, radio astronomy. Was there a ping? Hmm. I thought I heard it. Sorry? Hello. Hello. Is there any yeah.
Hello. If you have a question, then please speak up. Speak now or forever remain silent. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it does look like. Forever being one hour later. Okay, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's proceed. Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the hyperfine line. In addition to this, you can also have radio, what are called radio recombination lines, which are basically like Lyman alpha, Barmer alpha, and so on. But these are basically uh, transitions between principal quantum number states, but with high values of n. And these lines are, there's a whole slew of these lines, for example, state 110 to 109, 105 to 104, and so on down the, the, down the chain. And depending on the, on the transitions between this, the two states, you'll wind up having the lines at different frequencies. And these lines are also, such radio recombination lines are also seen in, for example, helium, carbon, and so on. So these are examples of lines that you see in atomic hydrogen. And of course, these have counterparts in other species. But they are, because atomic hydrogen is so abundant in the universe, they are lines which are extremely important to, to probe astronomical sources. So let's move on now. And now we'll do a thing where we'll go across the, uh, the wave bands. So let's start with the ultraviolet and the optical. So we started with hydrogen, but uh, species which have uh, atomic numbers greater than or equal to three in astronomy are called metals. Astronomers are not known for being uh, very accurate in their speech. So everything from lithium onwards is called a metal. And metal lines are basically electronic lines from neutral or ionized iron, magnesium, silicon, carbon, oxygen, whatever, all the species higher than lithium at uh, ultraviolet or optical wavelengths. So these are atomic transitions. And the bottom plot over here shows you an average over 1,000 quasars from a paper by Wilkes et al. 2000, where they've just taken a lot of quasars, aligned them, uh, uh, basically corrected for their redshift, and aligned them, and averaged all the quasar spectra to show you all the spectral lines. And so what you see is that the Lyman alpha line, so this goes from 1,000 angstroms, roughly, to about 6,000 angstroms, uh, from ultraviolet up to the optical, and you see Lyman alpha is the strongest of all these lines in quasars. And that goes, and these are arbitrary units, but it gives you the feeling for the relative strengths of the lines. So Lyman alpha is very, very strong. You see a very weak line at about 1035 angstroms. And that's from O6. O6 is basically quintuply ionized oxygen. So uh, H1 corresponds to neutral hydrogen. Uh, uh, C1 corresponds to neutral carbon. C2 is singly ionized carbon, C3 is doubly ionized carbon, C4 is triply ionized carbon. So O6 is quintuply ionized oxygen, five electrons are missing, and that has a doublet at about 1035 angstroms, and it comes from fairly hot gas. Then here you have C4, triply ionized carbon, at about 1550 angstroms. You have doubly ionized carbon at 1909 angstroms. You have a nice magnesium 2, singly ionized magnesium doublet <coughs> at 2798 angstroms. And then you have the Balmer series over here. So you have H delta, H gamma, H, H beta, uh, between 4000 and 4861 angstroms. H alpha is beyond 6000, so you can't see it here. And then you see this very beautiful oxygen 3 line, doubly, ion, uh, doubly ionized oxygen. And this is actually a triplet, but with two strong components at 4960 and 5007 angstroms. And there's also an oxygen doublet, which happens at 3727 angstroms. So this gives you a feeling for the kind of species that you can see with in very standard spectra today of quasars. That you see a whole range of atomic species, uh, hydrogen, carbon, magnesium, oxygen, and oxygen are different ionization states, carbon are different ionization states. And so the, the strengths of the, of the relative uh, ionization state or the relative strengths of the lines of different ionization states tells you about the abundance of these states. And so it tells you about the chemistry of the, the, the local chemistry in the, in the object. So this is emission. Let's move on to a slightly different thing, which is absorption. Again, as I said, the metal lines are all these electronic lines in, uh, in these various uh, uh, species, neutral ionized iron, magnesium, silicon, carbon, and so on. But what happens, suppose you have gas between you and the quasar. So what's shown over here is a plot where I have a background quasar and I'm at, at some high redshift. And so this is the Lyman alpha emission line of that quasar. And this now is plotted in terms of observed wavelength, where the observed wavelength for a redshifted object, if the redshift is z, the observed wavelength is the rest wavelength multiplied by 1 plus z. So Lyman alpha is at 1215 angstroms at, at the rest frame. 
So this is at about 4,800 angstroms. And this tells you immediately this quasar is at a redshift of about 3. Because 1 plus 3 multiplied by 1,200 gives you about 4,800. So this quasar is at a redshift of about 3. Now what you see blueboard of the, of the Lyman alpha emission of the quasar, you see this amazing stretch of these very narrow absorption lines. You can barely see the quasar continuum itself. You see all these narrow absorption lines over here. And these absorption lines are actually Lyman alpha absorption from the intergalactic medium. So there's gas in the intergalactic medium, hydrogen gas, between us and the quasar. And this is, of course, at redshifts lower than the quasar. So 1 plus Z multiplied by Lyman alpha for this gas comes to a slightly lower wavelength than the Lyman alpha of the quasar. So you see it blueboard at a lower wavelength than the quasar Lyman alpha. And the strength of these lines depends on the amount of hydrogen at each redshift. And then every so often you see a, a very powerful Lyman alpha absorption line with a very broad absorption. And that line comes when you have a galaxy sitting between us and the quasar. So that galaxy gives rise to a very strong Lyman alpha absorption because it has a lot of hydrogen inside it. There's much less hydrogen in the intergalactic medium. And that produces this powerful absorption line where you can see what are called these characteristic Lorenzian wings, damping wing. These are called damped Lyman alpha absorbers going out to like 1 upon uh, lambda squared plus a squared. And that's a very strong absorption line. But what is interesting, so, so this is kind of the lines that you see in what are called the Lyman alpha forest. Th there's a forest of lines. And every so often you see the strong uh, damped Lyman alpha line from a if a galaxy is lies towards the quasar. But what is interesting is that if you look redward of the quasar Lyman alpha, you actually see this normal quasar continuum. This is broadband emission from the quasar. And that's the, the carbon-4 emission from the quasar we saw a little while earlier. But you also see these very narrow absorption lines. And these narrow absorption lines are actually from gas in this galaxy. So for example, this is a nickel, singly ionized nickel absorption line. This is a silicon-2, singly ionized silicon absorption line. This is the carbon-4 doublet from this Dantlam and Alpha system. This is an iron uh, uh, absorption line. This is aluminum-2, uh, singly ionized aluminum neutral magnesium, uh, singly ionized nickel, and so on. So now, with these lines, I can trace the chemistry of this galaxy in absorption. And some of these lines are too weak to be seen in emission, but you see them in absorption when I have a bright enough torch, like a quasar or a star, behind the, behind the galaxy or the gas. And so that becomes very interesting indeed. So let's move on from the uh, ultraviolet and optical through the mid-IR. So in the mid-IR, the mid-infrared, you mainly have lines which come from the very strange benzene ring-like objects, which are called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs. And these are really interesting objects or, or species because their importance or their existence was not really known until the 90s. And then people realized in the 90s, after, after they were found, that these are actually extremely important in the heating and cooling of the interstellar medium because they contain these very loosely bound electrons in outer shells. And these electrons can be very easily uh, kicked out of these, uh, of these molecules. And when, they, when they're kicked out, they're basically kicked out with some kinetic energy, and so they can heat the interstellar medium. So such uh, photoelectrically ejected electrons are the primary heating source of the interstellar medium in the Milky Way and similar galaxies. But what is cute about the PHs is that they have these, so PHs are basically carbon and hydrogen uh, 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 ring molecules, and they have other, they could have other species attached to them, but carbon and hydrogen are the main uh, constituents. And now, depending on the bonds that you have between, you might have carbon carbon double bonds, carbon hydrogen bonds, you can have bending, stretching, or vibrational modes of these bonds. And that gives you a set of lines between about 2 and 20 microns. And because these lines are coming from the bond, not from, the, uh, not, not from the molecule in question, you'll actually have a lot of lines from a range of molecules of different types, but with the same uh, uh, CH or C, or, or C double C bond, all of which will add up at roughly the same frequency. And the result of this is that if you look at a galaxy, which has a lot of pHs, the pH lines are extremely strong. So this now is a plot at the bottom, <clears throat> which shows an example of a galaxy spectrum. And this is the, these are the emission lines of the galaxy. So this is in the 1 to 10 micron range. And you see there are these really powerful lines over here. These are pH lines. 
And they dominate the spectrum of galaxies in the mid-infrared wavelengths. They are much stronger than the background continuum of galaxies. And they are especially strong in what are called starburst galaxies. So these are all, but they come in this very narrow range, going out to about 20 microns, starting at about, in fact, about a, a few microns, 3 microns, 2.5 microns is the lowest wavelength of the PHs. And the strong lines are between about 6 and about 11, 11 12 microns. So that's the mid-infrared. <clears throat> In the far infrared, you have a completely different type of spectral lines typically. And these are mainly from fine structure transitions. And these are fine structure in metals arising from relativistic corrections to the, to the energy states in, uh, in, to, to, the, to, to the principal quantum number state or from spin orbit interactions or from the Darwin term. And the strongest of these lines is from, the, is from ionized carbon, singly ionized carbon at, at 158 microns. So that sharp feature that you see over here is from the C plus 158 micron emission. But you also have lines, for example, from neutral oxygen at 63 microns over here. You have doubly ionized oxygen at 88 microns. You have a weak line of singly ionized nitrogen at 122 microns, a slightly stronger line from singly ionized nitrogen at 205 microns, and so on. And these are roughly between 50 and 300 microns. And these lines have become extremely important today. So they're, they're, they're very strong lines, but the problem is that they're in the far infrared. So as you'll see in a minute, these lines are, cannot be observed from the ground with, uh, with telescopes in the ground because the atmosphere is opaque in the far infrared. So therefore, you have to build satellites like the ISO satellite or as is shown over here. So this shows the, the blue horizontal lines over here show the Herschel sensitivities for different, for different uh, instruments on in Herschel, PAX and SPIRE. And so you have to build satellites to send them and send them above the atmosphere to observe these lines. And this has actually been done because these lines are so important. But the beauty of cosmology is that if you have redshifted objects, the line frequencies are redshifted to lower frequencies. So if you take an object, for example, at a redshift of about 2, the C plus line, which is at 158 microns, which corresponds to 1.9 terahertz, for a redshift of 2, that line is redshifted to 600 gigahertz. And you can actually observe that line from the ground with a telescope like ALMA. So ALMA has completely changed our view of the high redshift universe by observing these far infrared spectral lines from high redshift galaxies. And that's been super fun. And, I, and if, I, if I have time, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about this at the end. Then moving on into the millimeter, you have the most important molecular rotational lines, which happen because of end-on-end -end rotation of molecules. And of these, the most important lines are the CO lines. CO is the second most abundant molecule in the interstellar medium. H2, of course, molecular hydrogen is the most abundant molecule. But molecular hydrogen does not have any easily detectable lines. They are detected only in very special circumstances, hot gas. CO has the strongest molecular lines. And these lines, for example, for CO are at a frequency of about 115.27 gigahertz multiplied by J, where J is the upper rotational quantum number level. So, for example, the 1 to 0 line is at 115.27 gigahertz. The 2 to 1 line is at 230 gigahertz. The 3 to 2 line is at 345 gigahertz. 4 to 3 is at 460 gigahertz and so on. So, these form a ladder of lines, a rotational ladder. And by observing the strengths of different lines in this ladder, you can get information about the conditions in the molecular ISM. And, of course, there are uh, very similar molecular rotational lines from other species. Things like water, for example, H2O, HCN. HCO plus, HNC. And again, you can now use these lines to probe the chemistry of the interstellar medium, which has become a huge industry over the last 30 or so years, especially now with ALMA. And that's just the simple strongest molecular rotational lines. Beyond that, you have even more interesting lines, which are, for example, from uh, water. But these are complicated water lines, not coming from rotation, but which are mixed transitions. And so, for example, there are these powerful water megamasers at 22 gigahertz which have been used to actually probe the distance, to, to constrain the distance scale, to anchor the, the distance scale in cosmology. You have ammonia inversion transitions. You have methanol tunneling transitions. You have OH lambda double transitions. The physics is complex, very interesting physics. And line frequencies go from about 1 to about 1,000 gigahertz, a wide range of frequencies. And again, all these lines tell you about the physics of the interstellar medium. So you can actually spend a career, if you like, on one of these species, and it's great fun. I wouldn't recommend it, but it's great fun. 
So let's move on now to why you should love radio spectroscopy. And I alluded to this in passing when I said that, uh, that the far infrared lines have to be observed from above the atmosphere. So this plot shows you the atmospheric opacity uh, as a function of wavelength, starting from uh, gamma rays over here and going all the way up to the to, to very long wavelength radio. So, so this is about 0.1 nanometers and this is one kilometer wavelength. And so what you see is that the atmospheric opacity is basically 100% all the way from the gamma rays through the, through the X-rays, through the ultraviolet, until you reach the optical band. So the optical band is, is shown over here and over here in uh, whatever, in, in blue to red. And that's the narrow range, as you can see in this lower panel, in the lower panel, which you can actually observe from the ground, where the atmospheric op opacity drops. Now when you go to the near infrared, the opacity slowly starts to rise, but there are still holes, there are windows where you can observe from the ground or from telescopes like, uh, uh, or from like, like the Keck telescope or the VLT at very high sites, Mauna Kea in, uh, in Hawaii or Paranal in Chile. And then there's a hole at about 10-ish microns over here, but again, you can do a little bit of work from high sites uh, on the planet. And then when you get to the mid-infrared and then the far-infrared, things are completely blank again. You can't observe from the ground. And then at about about, let's say, a, a, a one terahertz or so, if you're at a spectacular site like ALMA, you can start to barely observe at, uh, from, from you know, five, uh, ALMA is at 5,000 meters above sea level. So you can start to observe uh, over here. One millimeter is about 300 gigahertz, and you can comfortably observe with ALMA at uh, one millimeter. And then you start moving down over here into the, into the millimeter. So this is a submillimeter, this is a millimeter. And now you see that at about roughly a, a centimeter or so, all the way out to about uh, roughly 10 meters or so, the entire atmosphere is completely transparent. And this is the radio wave band. So you can see that the radio wave band covers a huge frequency range and gives you access to a humongous amount of information about the universe. For comparison, the other wave band where you can observe from the ground is the optical, where you can see that the frequency range is tiny. The frequency range of the optical is only about 3,000 angstroms to 10,000 angstroms. It's about a factor of three or so. In the radio wave band, it goes from about a centimeter to about 10 meters. So it's about a factor of 1,000. And that tells you that you can basically observe, get much more information about the universe in the radio than at any other wave band. The reason that it's so important, it's so important that you can observe from the ground is that when you're observing from the ground, you can actually build big telescopes. So you have a much, 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 much higher sensitivity. For example, if you think of the, you know, the, the, the most famous optical or ultraviolet telescope, that's the Hubble Space Telescope. And that's produced wonderful results uh, because it's above the atmosphere. But the Hubble Space Telescope is only 2.4 meters in diameter. <clears throat> the big telescopes on the ground are 10 meters in diameter, or 12 is the biggest today. And we are building 30 meter telescopes on the ground. So it's possible to build huge telescopes with large collecting, large light buckets, so to speak, to observe the ground. So your sensitivity is much, much higher from the ground. And as I said, the radio sky goes from about 30 meters to about 0.3 millimeters, about a factor of 10 to the 3, more than 10 to the 3. The optical sky is only a factor of 3. And that gives you much more information in the radio <clears throat> than the optical. And that's one big reason why you should love the radio. <clears throat> The second reason why radio is so important is that dust is a, a, an important constituent of galaxies. When stars uh, give out metals, the metals can bind onto dust grains and form bigger and bigger dust grains, more and more dust. And what dust does is that it can basically obscure optical and ultraviolet light. And this is a real problem because this means that if you, do, if you don't see something, how do you know if that object is really not emitting? or if there is a dust cloud between you and that object. And a beautiful example of this in the Milky Way is this object called Barnard 68. And this shows you a VLT image of uh, a region of the, of the galaxy. And you see this spectacular black region over here, which has apparently no stars in it. And uh, you see all these stars. I mean, this is a VLT image. It's an absolutely gorgeous image with an 8 meter glass telescope. Lovely stars all around the place. And then no stars at all over here. And you'd say, gosh, something really strange must have happened over here, which blew out all the stars in that region. But of course, in reality, nothing strange has happened. All that's happened is that there's a big dark cloud 
called, of course, Barnard 68, sitting between us and the stars. And so if you look at this object now with the VLT again, but now in the near infrared, where the absorption from dust is much less, you can now start to barely see these stars coming out over here. And you see the number of stars is about the same over here and over here. And it's still hard to see them in the near infrared because the cloud is so dark. The important thing in the radio is that radio observations are not affected by dust at all. Dust is, a, 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 I mean, dust grains will affect things which have the size, uh, whose wavelength is the size of the dust grains. And the, the dust grains in the ISM are typically of the size of optical wavelengths. So the radio, you, you, you don't care at all about dust. And a good example of this is that uh, until the late 1990s, there had been, you know, 400 years of optical astronomy. But it was only in 1998, for the first time, when the scuba camera was put on top of the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope, that we suddenly found this population of galaxies at high redshifts, which are now called submillimeter galaxies, which had never been known earlier. And these objects are starburst galaxies, and they are really, really dusty. So they're so dusty that all the light from the optical and ultraviolet is completely obscured by their own dust. You don't see them at all in the optical, or you barely see them in the optical, with very, very deep observations. But they're the brightest objects in the submillimeter. And this is spectacular. And these are hugely massive objects. They're forming stars like crazy. The reason they're so bright in the submillimeter is that the ultraviolet photons of these massive stars are heating up the dust, and the dust is radiating in the submillimeter. So this is fantastic. These are these massive, massive galaxies, which we had no idea about until 1998. And so now it turned out that one of the, the, the brightest submillimeter source in the Hubble Deep Field, which was one of the deepest images made in the old days, the brightest submillimeter source was called HDF 850.1. And this is the HST image of that region, and the submillimeter source is shown by this plus sign over here. And you see there's nothing there in the HST image. There's an object to the left and an object to the right, nothing at the position of the submillimeter galaxy. And uh, Fabian Walter and company went and observed and then searched for the object, this object, with, with the with the plateau de Bord interferometer using the C plus 158 micron line and just searching. And what they found was strong emission shown in the contours over here, overlaid on the HST image. So those are the HST, uh, the, the objects that you see over here are the HST objects in red and slight blue. The contours are the C plus emission. And you would never see this in the optical because you can't even see the galaxy, let alone the spectral line. But you could measure its redshift and find that the redshift is 5.1. It's a very, very, very high redshift source, very, very, very bright, powerful star formation, not seen at all in the optical, but can be seen loud and clear in the radio. And such objects dominate the star formation rate of the high redshift universe. Uh, they have star formation rates of hundreds to thousands of solar masses per year at redshifts of between 2 and 4. So this can be seen really in the radio and, and the far infrared. The next thing about, ra about radio is that you can do radio interferometry. You can combine telescopes together, combine the signals of multiple telescopes to synthesize a much, much, much bigger telescope than a single an individual telescope. And this can give you wonderful angular resolution. So the angular resolution of a telescope is, is approximately lambda by d, but lambda is the wavelength and d is the diameter. And I put diameter in quotes because for a radio interferometer, something like the giant meter wave radio telescope, which we built here at Narangao, near, near Narangao, or the very large array in New Mexico, the, the, the D over there is, is the diameter of the array, which if you like is the largest separation between the, 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 the antennas of the array. So for example, in the case of the GMRT, we have 30 antennas. In the case of the VLA, there are 27 antennas. In the case of ALMA, there are 50 antennas. So for the VLA, the, 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 there are 27 antennas with the largest separation of 35 kilometers. With ALMA, which is shown over here on this, on this beautiful site, 5,000 meters high, that's a lovely volcano called Likan Kabur, which is 5,900 meters in the background. And these are the ALMA antennas. The largest uh, baseline, the largest separation is 16 kilometers. And for the very long baseline array, which is in the, in the US, there are 10 antennas spread over the entire US, ranging from Puerto Rico in the extreme east, all the way up to Hawaii in the extreme west. And there the D, the, the effective diameter, is 10,000 kilometers. And so now they can compare the resolutions that you can get with, with the optical and the radio. So in the optical, of course, our best resolution comes from the Hubble Space Telescope. 
where the wavelength is roughly 6,000 angstroms, the red, diameter is 2.4 meters, and your resolution, angular resolution, is about 0.05 arc seconds, 50 milli arc seconds. And that's great. That's the best you can get because you're above the atmosphere. The very large array, the shortest wavelength is uh, 43 gigahertz or 7 millimeters. And the, the size of the array is 35 kilometers. And you already get to about 40 milli arc seconds with this, with this array, which is already better than the HST. If you go to ALMA, ALMA can easily do 0.3 millimeters. Uh, well, not easily. ALMA can go up to 0.3 millimeters. And with, uh, with a diameter of 16 kilometers, you get about 4 milli arc seconds. So, with a factor of 10 better than the VLA or better than the HST. And then over here with the very long baseline array at 7 millimeters, you can you have a D of 10,000 kilometers. And that means that your angular resolution is about 0.15 milli arc seconds. And of course, many of you have seen the wonderful Event Horizon Telescope images of uh, the black hole in Virgo A. And those are at an even higher resolution because there what's happening is that the lambda is more like one millimeter. And, and, the, and the distance is about 10,000 kilometers. That's a factor of seven uh, smaller resolution, more like 0 0.02 milli arc seconds. So that's what you can do with the radio. Because you have interferometers, you have phase information, you can actually get amazing angular resolution on the sky. Finally, uh, an important issue which is often not appreciated is that the main constituents of galaxies are dark matter, which is non-baryonic, stars and gas. And if you want to understand galaxies, or you want to understand the life cycle of galaxies, or even of the constituents of galaxies, you must understand both the stars and the gas. The gas is the interstellar medium, the ISM. And galaxies look very different than stars and gas. This shows you a beautiful example uh, of a very famous spiral galaxy, NGC 6946, with the left panel in the optical. You see these beautiful sp spiral arms over here. <clears throat> and these are to the same scale. The right panel shows you an H1 21 centimeter image of the same galaxy. And the first thing that jumps out at you is that you see the spiral arms, but this galaxy is much bigger in 21 centimeter emission than it is in the stars. And that's a standard feature of galaxy. The gas goes out much, much, much further. So if you want to understand a galaxy, you must look at both the gas and the stars. Of course, in addition to that, stars form from gas. So if you want to understand star formation, you must look at the gas. And <clears throat> the critical ISM spectral lines, 21 centimeters, CO rotational lines, C plus line, all lie radio wavelengths. And so again, you need to be in the radio to actually carry out these observations. And the beauty of radio interferometry, again, is that you can actually make spectral line images, what are called spectral cubes of, of an object, and trace the kinematics and trace, trace the structure and the kinematics of the object. And that, that's absolutely wonderful. It's only now becoming possible in the optical with what are called integral field units, things like uh, the mu spectrograph on the VLT and uh, the cosmic web imager on the Keck telescope. But we've been doing this in the radio for the last 50 years or so. So, okay, so let's move on to a few good, <clears throat> a few fun lines in the radio. So I mentioned the H1 21 centimeter line, and that's a hyperfine line in atomic hydrogen. <clears throat> I beg your pardon, my throat is killing me at uh, 1420 megahertz. And I'll talk about this a bit more. You can use this to measure the atomic gas mass of galaxies, galaxy sizes, as you saw over here, how big is the galaxy, rotation curves, which I'll tell you a little bit about again at the end of the talk, <clears throat> gas temperature, even magnetic field strength with the 21 semi line by the Zeeman effect, lots of other things. The CO lines, as I mentioned, are rotational lines in the CO molecule, the carbon monoxide molecule, at 115.27 multiplied by J gigahertz. And this lets you measure the molecular gas mass of galaxies. And these lines are very strong, unlike the 21 centimeter line. And we can detect these all the way out now to redshifts of about 6, which is pretty spectacular. So I can tell you what the molecular gas masses of galaxies at redshifts of 6, 6.5, <clears throat> all the way down to today's universe. The C plus 115 micron line is even more special. <clears throat> and this is special because uh, it's an ionized carbon at 1.9 terahertz. But the reason it's so important is that it's the strongest cooling line in galaxies. And it contains about 0.5% of, of the entire luminosity of a galaxy. In one spectral line, <clears throat> it contains 0.5% of the entire integrated luminosity from gamma rays up to radio. <clears throat> and so if you can detect it, it's wonderful. 
But of course, it's not really a radio line. It's a far infrared line. But it's redshifted into the ALMA band for redshifts larger than 1. And this makes it fantastic <clears throat> to detect and map the kinematics of high redshift galaxies. And this has resulted in the first detection of disk galaxies at very high redshifts, redshifts larger than 4, answering very fundamental questions of galaxy formation in the universe. Then there are things like H2O mega masers, by which you can measure black hole masses and you can infer the Hubble constant. And there's some wonderful work of Mark Reed for the last 25 years or so, getting the distances to a very famous H2O mega maser galaxy, NGC 4258, more and more accurately. And this has resulted in what, what is called today a crisis in cosmology, <clears throat> where the local universe measurements of the Hubble constant turn out to be slightly larger than the high redshift measurement. Of the, of the Hubble constant at about four sigma difference. And so this could be a sign of new physics beyond the standard model of cosmology. So this is an, an area of active research today. And uh, Shimon mentioned that I love fundamental constants. I couldn't resist telling you something about them. You can use transitions in ammonia and methanol and OH, even 21 centimeter, to probe evolution of the fundamental constants. The way you do this is that the spectral line, these spectral lines, the line frequencies, have different dependencies on different fundamental constants. So if you calculate the dependence using molecular atomic theory, and if you can go and measure these lines at, uh, at high redshifts, you can compare the redshifts of different lines and check if the redshift measured from different lines is the same. If the fundamental constants change, it will turn out that the redshifts are going to be different from the different lines. And so that turns out to be a very powerful probe of changes in the fundamental constants. And it's the only way, really, of looking for changes in the fundamental constants on cosmological timescales, timescales of 10 billion years, which is extremely interesting and possibly forecast by unification theories, which go beyond the standard model of particle physics. So now I'm going to just do a, <clears throat> uh, since I thought I should talk about one spectral line in a little more detail, I'm going to do a jump and tell you about the 21 centimeter line, which I said at the start <clears throat> is, it comes in hydrogen, <clears throat> and it's very different from the standard lyman barmer Paschen series, which are these transitions from principal quantum number states. So this is a hydrogenic atom, uh, 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 nuclear charge plus ZD. In the case of hydrogen, of course, it's just plus E. And the lyman barmer Paschen series are just jumps in, in principal quantum number states. The 21 centimeter line is a genuine quantum mechanical transition. It cannot be understood semi-classically. It's a transition which happens because of spin, which is a quantum mechanical concept. And as I said, it, the transition is between states with parallel spins, where the electron and proton have parallel spins, to, states where the, to a state where the electron and proton have anti-parallel spins, and that produces a line with a frequency of 1420 megahertz. And to contrast the, the uh, ultraviolet to optical lines with the hydrogen line, the, the ultraviolet to optical lines, the lyman barmer Paschen series, are very strong lines. They have Einstein A coefficients of about 10 to the 8 per second, which means that you very rapidly go down to the ground state. And these, these are at ultraviolet or optical wavelengths. The 21 centimeter line is an extremely weak line. It's a hyperfine line, it's forbidden. Its Einstein A coefficient is about 10 to the minus 15 per second, which means that uh, it's 10 to the 23 times weaker than the optical ultraviolet lines, but yet it's an extremely important line in astronomy. And the frequency is 21 centimeters. And so during the, during, in the middle of World War II, Jan Oort, so this is shortly after the birth of radio astronomy, Jan Oort, who is a famous Dutch astronomer, who was, uh, I mean, just a, you know, who did all kinds of astronomy theory to observations, he had set a problem to his students saying that, are there any radio lines? So it was very soon after the birth of radio astronomy, where uh, Karl Jansky first and then Grote Rieber had observed uh, radio waves from the galaxy. And so Jan Oort said, oh my gosh, if you could find lines in the radio, then they won't be affected by dust. And one thing that he was very excited about was mapping the structure of the Milky Way. And the problem with doing that in the optical is that dust uh, blocks the radiation. So you don't know if you can, if you're actually seeing the structure of the Milky Way or the structure of dust. So he came up with the idea that if you can uh, come up, you can find a radio line, then dust will not be a problem. And a very smart student, Hendrik van der Hulst, argued in 1944, again, you know, this is in a period where the Germans and Nazis are occupying uh, the Netherlands, that the atomic hydrogen 21 centimeter line should be detectable. So they forecast this line, forecast its frequency, and then a number of groups tried to find it. Jan Oort was one of the people leading this. 
And it was finally found in 1951 uh, by Doc Ewen and Ed Purcell in the US, and then by Muller and Ord uh, around the same time, and then by Chris Christensen and collaborators in Australia. So this was the first spectral line in radio astronomy. And the next step, of course, was to find this line from external galaxies. And that was found a few years later by Frank Kerr and collaborators uh, in Australia using Chris Christensen's uh, telescope. And they found 21 centimeter emission with large Magellanic clouds. And so at which point now it was great fun. You could use this line to probe galactic structure. And that's what Oort did in a series of papers in the 50s. Barry Clark later in the 60s argued that uh, based on comparisons between emission and absorption, that the gas in the Milky Way and other galaxies has to be both warm and cold. You need to have two phases, the warm neutral medium and the cold neutral medium. And that's because the absorption lines are seen to be very narrow and the emission lines are seen to be broad. So that kind of gave you information that the, 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 the temperature of the line, the temperature of the gas, which gives rise to the spread of the line, has to be different for the absorbing gas and the emitting gas. And so, so people started doing physics with this line. And as I said, the reason 21 centimeter emission is so wonderful, 21 centimeters so wonderful, is that galaxies are made up of stars and gas, about 75% hydrogen by mass. And the life cycle of a galaxy is basically gas accretes onto a galaxy from the circumgalactic medium or the intergalactic medium, ionized gas, and this cools and forms atomic gas. The atomic gas then further cools and forms molecular gas. The molecular gas undergoes gravitational collapse and forms stars. The stars live their lives and then blow up in the form of supernovae. The supernovae chuck metals back into the interstellar medium, and the metals cause further cooling of the atomic gas, which causes further production of molecular gas, which causes further production of stars, further production of supernovae, further production of metals, and it's a beautiful cycle until all the gas is of the circumgalactic medium is eaten up. And then the galaxy basically dies and becomes a dead, dead galaxy. And atomic hydrogen, as you can see immediately, is the primary fuel for star formation. And so what's happening is that the atomic hydrogen, the, the, the gas is believed to accrete in the outskirts of the galaxy and then to flow inwards and to form stars in the, cent in the centers of, the ga of galaxies. And that's why you see this picture where you have the stars are roughly the central regions and the atomic hydrogen is in the outskirts. The beauty of 21 centimeter is that the 21 centimeter emission strength is proportional to the atomic hydrogen gas mass. And the atomic hydrogen gas mass is, as you might imagine, a very fundamental piece of information about a galaxy. It's the fuel for star formation. It's all the fuel that you have. And the strength of the 21 centimeter emission line is the only way today to measure the atomic hydrogen mass of galaxies. So it is the only way to get uh, a very foundational descriptor of galaxies. The problem, unfortunately, is that because the Einstein A coefficient is so low, the 21 centimeter line is really weak. And this makes it hard to detect at cosmological distances. Very recently, just about a couple of months ago, a superb student, Aditya Chaudhary at uh, NCRA, has just detected the 21 centimeter line in emission for the first time at a redshift of one, and has shown that basically uh, galaxies at these redshifts have much, much, much more hydrogen mass, atomic hydrogen mass, than they have in the local universe. But they eat up that atomic gas very quickly. And that's the reason that you basically form stars very efficiently at high redshifts. And then the star formation rate declines at later times. So it's some really nice work. And it's the kind of work which is, which is now becoming possible with telescopes like the upgraded GMRT, and which will be possible over the next decade or two with the next generation of telescopes like the Square Kilometer Array. But I'm going to take a step back and tell you something which is even cuter, if you like, about what you can do with 21 centimeter emission. And this goes back to the 1970s, where there was a big question mark over what is the nature of the matter in the universe? And I said at the start, uh, spectral lines provide velocity information. And this plot over here, which you saw in the beginning of the talk, is of the galaxy M33, a companion of Andromeda. And uh, this is a beautiful rotating disk galaxy. The gas which is moving towards you is blue shifted. The gas moving away from you is red shifted. And so this is an image of M31 in the 21 centimeter line, color coded by velocity where the, the velocities moving towards you are blue, moving away from you are red. Now, what you can do is that you can actually measure how fast this galaxy is rotating as a function of radius. So I can measure the speed of the rotation at different points along the radius. And this is called the rotation curve of the galaxy. 
Now, if you think about, you know, why does a galaxy rotate? A galaxy is held in place by its mass. So if, a, if, a, if the gas is on, is on a circular orbit, its velocity, its rotational velocity, should go like roughly gm upon r raised to half. Fairly simple. And the problem is that the visible mass, the mass in stars, is mostly in the central region of galaxies. So this means that if I go to outer regions of the galaxy, if I go further and further out in the galaxy, I'm not increasing the mass by much. So I can assume that the mass is roughly constant. And this means from this equation, I must have the velocity should drop like 1 upon r to the half at large r. So what I would expect is that the rotation curve, the speed of rotation, should increase from the center, increase outwards, and then at some point it'll have a peak, and then it'll start to decline. And that's what you'd expect if the mass is what you see in, in these galaxies. But what people found in the 70s, first Vera Rubin with optical H-alpha spectroscopy, and then some wonderful work by Albert Bosma with the Westerbock telescope, which has just come online, was that galaxies are very different. So the plot at the bottom uh, over here shows you the velocity, the rotation velocity, as a function of radius in, in uh, kilo light years. So 30 is 30,000 light years. And the curve over here, the, the dotted curve, <clears throat> shows you the, the velocity expected from the optical, the visible disk. So that's the disk of the galaxy. And as you go further and further out, you expect that most of the mass, you see that most of the mass is in here. So as you go beyond about this point, you're, you're not adding much mass. So you expect that the rotation curve will decline. The, the rotation speed will go down and it'll keep declining as you go to larger and larger distances. But the actual data are plotted over here. And so the yellow points over here are from H alpha, from starlight. And you can see it rising. And you might say that, okay, you know, this is not very far out. Maybe it declines afterwards. But the wonderful thing about 21 centimeter is that because the 21 centimeter line, the, the H1 gas goes out much further. I can probe the galaxy now on much bigger scales. So these points over here in the white are actual measurements from the 21 centimeter line. And they go, as you can see, the stars stop at 15 kiloparsecs. The 21 centimeter line goes out to 50 kiloparsecs. And you can see that the velocity continues to increase all the way out to 50 kiloparsecs, although there's no stars at all out there, almost no stars out there. So what this is telling you loud and clear, the only way to explain this is that there must be more mass at large radii, which is not seen somehow. The mass has to increase with increasing radius. And what this tells you loud and clear is that this must require dark matter. And it turns out you can show this dark matter must be non-baryonic. And so by the end of the 70s, Sandy Faber and Gallagher wrote, a, wrote an excellent uh, review article in Annual Reviews of Astronomy and Astrophysics, where they summarized the, the uh, observations at that point. And they made the statement that it's our opinion that the case for the invisible matter in the universe is very strong, getting stronger. And today we believe that dark matter, based on observations, contains about uh, roughly a factor of four to five times more mass than baryons in the universe. So about 80% of the, of, the, of the matter of the universe is non-baryonic, and only about 20% is baryonic. Of course, in addition to that, you have dark energy, which contains about 70% of the total energy of the universe. But dark matter, or baryonic, non-baryonic dark matter, dominates the, the, or the baryonic uh, matter in the universe. And this came, the evidence for this, the direct evidence for this, came from spectroscopy and predominantly from the 21 centimeter line. So it tells you what you can do with 21 centimeter observations. And of course, these observations are getting better and better now, but this goes all the way back to the 1970s. Okay, so I'm going to summarize now, I'm nearly out of time. So I hope I've convinced you that, that astronomical spectral lines allow you to probe the physics and chemistry of gas and galaxies and the structure, the content, the mass, and the kinematics of these galaxies. And you can do all kinds of stuff with, with astronomical spectroscopy. You can measure galaxy sizes, dynamical masses, gas densities, temperatures, pressures, masses, magnetic fields. Even nicer, you get velocity information. And you can do tons of things with this. You can measure the expansion and acceleration of the universe. You can measure the distance scale, for example, with H2 omega masers, the velocity fields of galaxies, H alpha and uh, 21 centimeter. Even more cute things are happening today where you can actually search for the origins of life 
by searching for complex organic molecules. For example, glycine, uh, the, the, the simplest proteins in the interstellar medium. And work on this is, is underway today with telescopes like ALMA. Spectral lines allow you to find, to, to identify, to, to, to detect and identify and then study the first galaxies. You can test cosmological predictions. You can study planet formation via gas and protoplanetary disks. Again, all of these are possible today with millimeter and radio spectroscopy. And finally, you can actually even do things like testing the standard model of particle physics on cosmological timescales via studies of fundamental constant evolution. And I've left a dot dot and ellipsis down at the bottom because this just lists a very small subset of all the things you can do with astronomical spectroscopy. So I'll leave it there then. Thank you. Uh, uh, so now it's up for questions. So Anki Mina has a question. How do you distinguish the extra 21 centimeter emission from that that is arising from our own galaxy? Huh, that's a very good question. So uh, it, it all depends on the on the velocity of the emission. So if the object is at, so remember that the, the line is Doppler shifted. So now if I have a galaxy which is moving relative to the Milky Way, then its 21 centimeter line will actually not be at 1420.40575 megahertz. It will be at 1420.40575 megahertz multiplied, formally divided by one plus Z, where Z is the redshift. Or if you want velocity, it will be shifted downwards by the velocity of the galaxy. So if the, if the galaxy is moving away from us, it will be it will be red shifted to lower frequencies. If it's if it's moving towards us, it will be blue shifted. Now, of course, there are galaxies which are very close by where you actually have to worry about this. But there are not too many such galaxies. For most galaxies, they're sufficiently far away that they're moving relative to us. The Milky Way, for example, has a velocity width of about 300 kilometers per second. And so as long as the as the object is moving away from us with a speed more than about a couple of hundred kilometers per second or towards us with a similar speed, you can easily separate the two. I, I really don't understand this particular question. Uh, what we which know, question? Uh, can we know which type of radiation is emitted from these lines? I think it was probably other way around, uh, probably just by looking at the line, can you tell the radiation, something about the okay, radiation? Okay, so, so I can interpret that question in multiple ways. Yeah. So so one way is to say that can you tell uh, can you tell the nature of the physics? Can you work out if the line is a fine structure line? Can you work out if uh, uh, from first principles? And the answer is that for, uh, you have to first identify the line. If you identify the line, then you can say what the physics is. And that can be an interesting question in the sense that for example, uh, certain lines will be excited, will be observable only under certain physical conditions. So by identifying the line, working out what the physics is of the line, the, you, you can say something about where the line has come, what conditions are, the, the line has come from. So, so that's one way of, of thinking of the, of, this, of the question and the answer to this question. Um, it, it, uh, does that answer the question or do you have, do you have, do you have an, a, a different point of view on that? Okay, it says it is precisely what he was asking, probably. Okay. Are there any other questions? Also, just oh, Pratik, uh, Pratik Mayank, yeah, uh, and Andi, their hands are up. So, speak first, then Sirsi, unmute your mic. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, sir, uh, thank you for uh, such a wonderful talk. Sir, uh, I had a very uh, trivial question regarding that uh, how we know that a particular uh, molecular element has that uh, specific uh, spectra, means uh, related to the wavelength. How we conclude that we have certain kind of confidence that this is exact? Yeah. Because that, that, that from, actually, that, that's a good question. So, so there are two ways in which you know this, and uh, and and it's a it's an interesting question. The the first way is that you can actually do theory. So you can, you can, you can, you can, for example, model a molecule uh, in the old days via some kind of Born-Oppenheimer approximation, for example. You can model atoms much more easily, but you can even model molecules. Today, you can do numerical models of molecules, and that will that that let you work out the energy levels of the molecules. And now, once you have the different energy levels, you can work out that okay, because I have these different energy levels, I must, I can have spectral transitions at this frequency. So that's one way of doing it. 
that's theory the second thing you can do and 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 very often this does not work for complicated molecules the second thing you can do is that you can you can uh, set up lab spectroscopy you can take a you know a, a gas of molecules in the lab and this is how many of these measurements are done you take a se- a, a gas in the lab and then you fire like a, an electric current through the gas and you excite the gas molecules to higher states and then do spectroscopy of the gas in the lab and then you observe a number of lines and then you say oh my gosh okay i have a line over here 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 and so you know that these lines come from this molecule so that's two simple ways of doing it and in the reality both are done so what you do is that it's kind of you know the, the the experimental work is done that feeds into the theory then the, now you know that there must be energy levels there in that molecule so now you can modify your your theoretical model of the molecule to make sure that you have those levels and then make predictions for other energies and then you can go and observe with the with the lab with the lab spectroscope for those energies for those uh, frequencies and so this is like a you know you kind of uh, uh, do the theory and the experiment and go forward and even nicer is that in some cases you actually see the molecule you see the spectral line in the in in, in the in astronomy first and that happens quite often you see the spectral line you don't know what the line is but you know that there is a strong spectral line in a uh, in some gas cloud now what you can do is that you can say okay what are the typical lines that you would see in uh, your what are the typical molecules so then you take all those molecules in the lab again do the same thing but you now you you focus on exactly that frequency where you saw where you seen the line and you basically look and check whether you can see a line at that frequency from those molecules so there are three broad ways of doing this one is pure theory or pure numerics two is pure lab observations and three is uh, via astronomy and all three of these actually are usually combined together to give you more and more information about uh, molecules and astronomy is quite remarkable in this because the, the the thing to remember is that we can't build these giant gas clouds in the lab this uh, uh, a galaxy is like a humongous lab right it's got these huge uh, gas clouds which contain tons and tons of molecules and so now this is like uh, when we when we take a telescope and observe it's like we are doing lab spectroscopy but of a huge cloud where we don't quite know what the species are inside and so then you you need to work out a way of connecting this to the to the uh, uh, to, to the actual uh, energy levels then that can be a lot of fun but yeah it's it's usually a three step process uh, with uh, theory new uh, theory and numerics and uh, lab spectroscopy and astronomical spectroscopy yeah so yeah. there is uh, can i have a uh, like yeah. additional counter question yeah yeah so, please sir yeah sir so i i was asking that uh, is uh, there is always a certain uh, Uh, think that uh, we cannot make that ion or uh, that molecule come to a perfect uh, rest so there will be certain motion so there will be always a red shift and again theoretically no no no, yeah. no 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 careful there will not be always a red shift there will always be either a red shift there will always be jittering either a red shift or a blue shift by a very small amount see you you're talking about you're talking about perfect rest which means the temperature is absolute zero yeah, right? yes sir yeah yeah that is not really a constraint that's a very tiny velocity spread i okay, mean for, means, for, for, yeah, for example yeah. gas clouds in the in, in the milky way will have temperatures of 10 20 kelvin so you see a spread in the line you see a velocity width because of its temperature but that's not a red shift it's a spread some some molecules or some atoms will move towards you some will move away from you so you so you won't see a single very narrow spectral line you see a spread in fact it's even better than that because in reality if you think about the about quantum mechanics even the idea of a single energy level of a perfect energy is not possible the uncertainty principle tells you that you cannot actually have a, 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 an idealized single energy uh, there is always a time scale of decay of any energy level which gives you a spread in the energy so the relation delta e delta t greater than or equal to h cross tells you that you must have a uh, a spread in the energy and this turns out to give you a natural broadening of spectral lines and this turns out to be another reason that you see those damped lamina alpha lines is actually a quantum mechanical this quantum mechanical effect which is natural broadening of the of the line yeah okay okay thank you sir 
sheet sir please go ahead uh, yes uh, thanks for the wonderful talk and so uh, i had couple of questions but i will ask just one for now so so mostly we talk about radio interferometry my question is that uh, what are the problems if there's any of inter interferometry in other wave bands of the spectrum like optical or so for better resolution yeah so the the the, the problem with the, is has to do with the phase so uh, at i mean one way of thinking about it is that you i mean i, I wouldn't advocate this very strongly but you you have phase information in the radio in the radio you're in the in the rally genes limit where you can think of electromagnetic radiation as behaving like a wave in the optical you're in the photon limit where you, where think of it as a wave is a bit dicey but basically the, the issue is that the time scale of coherence is linked to the frequency it's very hard to do interferometry and preserve uh, phase information in the in the in the optical that's the that's the the the, the main issue so what people are doing in the optical now is what is called intensity interferometry so people do interferometry but it's not uh, it's not a uh, 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 full interferometry it's intensity interferometry and so for example there is the what is called the vlt interferometer where people use the four uh, vlt telescopes the four very large telescopes and then two more uh, side telescopes to make a six element array and then you can observe very bright stars with this and do interferometry but that is intensity inter interferometry so you 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 losing the phase the, the issue is simply the coherence time scale of the radiation which is much longer on at radio wavelengths and much 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 shorter at optical wavelengths okay sir thank you okay uh, shohini has one question uh, if in the future we discover a newer way of looking at gravity that yeah. eliminates the need for dark matter will it significantly change how we work with red shifted spectrum oh uh, that's a, that's an interesting question uh, the answer is no i don't think so so the, the, the this is kind of an open ended question so so uh, let's take a step back uh, do we have direct evidence that uh, that objects at uh, let's say a redshift of 0.1 are actually at redshift of 0.1 uh, and that, that that's a good question the answer is that in some cases we do for example with ngc 4258 we have a uh, keplerian measurements of the distance of the object and we have we have an independent measurement of the of uh, the, the distance from cfe uh, uh, observations and from type 1a supernovae so all three are tied together you get similar results so it is unlikely that you will completely change your view of the universe the second thing is that remember that the speed of light is is constant uh or in a constant is not so important the speed of light is finite if the speed of light is finite that means that the, the, the more distant an object is the uh, uh further in the past i'm seeing its radiation from so for example when i look when I look at the sun i'm seeing its radiation i'm seeing it as it was 8 minutes ago So if I look at a very distant object, I am by definition seeing it, you know, way off in the past. So the connection between a redshift and uh, and look back time could change in principle. Suppose, for example, you fundamentally change your theory of gravity, right? Let's say the general relativity were completely wrong, and uh, you change your theory completely. The question is now, why does relativity work so well, and you know, on the scales that it does? so it is extremely unlikely that a model could completely overturn relative i mean you, you you could certainly get a model of quantum gravity but quantum gravity would have to reduce to relativity general relativity in the regime of large scales in the same way the general relativity reduces to newtonian mechanics on uh, if your velocities are small and your curvature is small so it is very unlikely that you would change your you know foundational concepts even if your uh, the theory of gravity changed in a substantial way you, you have to change very dramatically and that would require you to somehow uh uh meet uh, general relativity is probably the most tested theory of all physical theories that we know so you would have to somehow make this new theory match all the tests of relativity and yet not match this issue of of cosmology it's not easy so I, i i would be agnostic about it but but about as agnostic as i am about uh, teapots going around mars or whatever 
Uh, okay, so there was, I, I think we are running out of time and there's another speaker at 2.30. Uh, there was one question from Daneshwar uh, who was asking about any kind of uh, suggestion and about reference books, etc. Reference on books? On ast astronomical huh. spectroscopy. That yeah, uh, so there are books on spectroscopy. There is a book by Charles Kitchen, which I would recommend. It, it all depends on what your interests are. As in, you know, are you doing it from the point of view of a PhD? Are you doing it from the point of view of just learning about spectra? These are different things. So what I would suggest is that maybe you could, you, you know, you could individually write to me. I could send you a list of general textbooks on this. But, uh, but uh, uh, a lot of it depends on what your aims are in this. So, uh, so, so if you like, what I will do is that I'll send you a list of three or four standard textbooks on spectroscopy. And then, we, and then you can take it from there. But please feel, feel free to write to me. My email address is on the web, and, uh, and you probably have my email in this uh, in this thing as well. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and, and I'll I'll write back to you with information about uh, about the details that you want. Okay, okay. Let us all thank uh, Nishim once more. <laughs> and uh, before Nishim goes away, I just want to warn all of you um, about one thing: do not call him sir. He has not received <laughs> uh, knighthood yet. <laughs> probably he will soon. Because he warned me once, long back, uh, in a summer school. So, <laughs> that, that's don't the make that mistake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank and you. Uh, nice questions. And I hope to meet all of you again, or some of you at least again, at some, uh, at some point in person, rather than over the internet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Nishim. Okay. Thanks again. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Our next speaker is... Yeah, I'll just stop um, sharing the screen. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks.